shields. This is a 14th century type, sort of shield that a knight would use. You see it with its characteristic heraldic display. But what's it actually for on the battlefield? Well, that's one reason. And that's another. And another. But I can also use the shield as an attack weapon in its own right. Shields have been a key defensive weapon for at least 4,000 years. But their greatest heyday on the battlefield was in Anglo-Saxon England over a thousand years ago. For shield warfare, it was a golden age. Warriors would lock shields in a shield wall. At the Battle of Eddington in 878, the fate of England rested on the strength of the shield wall. Shields played a critical role in driving back the Viking invaders. But just what could they stand up to? I'm going to train my own shield wall and see how shields developed from the beautiful to the bizarre. Even today, they remain a first line of defense. Eleven hundred years ago, England was under brutal occupation. Much of it was controlled by the Danes, the Vikings. But there was an army of resistance. Local legend has it that the white horse above the village of Eddington was cut to mark the decisive battle. Leading the Saxon army was Alfred the Great. It's rather sad that history so often remembers him only for a trivial cooking accident, the burning of the cakes. But Alfred was more than that, much more, not least of which he was a great military leader. And he brought his army to this hillside in Wiltshire and he faced down the Viking threat. And he faced it with his shield wall, shoulder to shoulder with their shields. Surely there can never have been a more real testing ground for the Saxon shield. The Battle of Eddington was pivotal in the foundation of England as a nation. Everything depended on a clash of shield walls. But what were shields like in the age of Alfred the Great? Down the centuries, shields developed into many different forms. Some became extremely large, designed to be strong and resilient, perfect for fighting in the shield wall. Others grew smaller, designed for mobility, perfect for single combat. The very smallest were known as bucklers, and from the 13th century were often made of steel. In Tudor England, they became fashionable as part of the kit for the new craze of duelling. Bucklers are used really in quite a different way to regular shields. They're not really suitable to blocking a blow directly. Rather, they're used to deflect a blow. They can also be used as a steel fist to strike with, so they're also good offensive weapons. Fighting with a sword and buckler was popular, and young men would make a racket as they swaggered in the streets with their bucklers clashing against their swords. Hence the term swashbuckling. When you're defending against a buckler strike, there's a couple of things I need to bear in mind. It's not really suited to blocking head on because the energy transfers through the steel. It's much better if I deflect it, use the energy and send it away from me. One of the earliest fight manuals shows people sword and buckler fighting and they're using the buckler and the sword together. So the buckler is actually shielding the sword hand. I think that's less to do with protecting the hand and more to do with hiding the hand. So that if I'm like this, my opponent can't really read what I'm going to do. He can't see what angle the sword strikes coming. It can deceive you. It can come underneath. Or it can come from above. Or it can come as a thrust. In contrast to the fluid mobility of these small bucklers, the shields that made up Alfred's shield wall here at Eddington would have been much bigger. But how were these ancient shields made? 
the most famous to have survived is in the British Museum. 1,300 years old, it was unearthed in one of Britain's greatest archaeological discoveries, the Sutton Hoo ship burial. Who was this for? We think it's um, the burial of King Redwald, who died uh, about 625, 626, and he was the king of the Kingdom of the East Angles, which was quite a powerful kingdom in the mm. 7th century. You've got this big warrior cult where you get guys buried with spears and shields and then, of course, the very top men get buried with helmets. But the shield was regarded an esteemed bit of the war gear. You were a true warrior if you carried a shield from quite small bucklers to something like the Sutton Hoo shield, which is one of the biggest. Mm. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's pushing it's 90 centimetres. It's huge. The shield is adorned with images in bronze, copper and gold. The dragon in particular, I mean, it's a piece of the metalsmith's art. But also, of course, I mean, dragons, guardian of treasure, guarding the body that you're protecting, and the bird of prey. That's an amazingly strong image. Mm, obviously, this is a replica. Well, we know that this one, because from tiny, tiny fragments, was made of lime. Lime, of course, being linden. Yes, it linden is. Linden is what is sung about absolutely. in the sagas. Absolutely, absolutely. There it is in Beowulf, the linden shield. And so this gives us what I like to see as a direct link into that world. We've got single layer yes, of wooden boards yep. glued together. Yes. This is one of the great mysteries, I think, of, of shield construction, that the ones that have been found in bog finds do seem to be um, just glued together. Um, there's no evidence of tongue and grooving, for example. But, of course, the leather, which is, can be shrunk onto it, gives it that extra structure as well. To discover what punishment these shields could take, I'm going to have a replica built and test it to destruction. Here, on the battlefield of Eddington, 1100 years ago, the future of England hung in the balance. As Vikings ravaged the last independent kingdom, Wessex, Alfred the Great mustered an army for a final showdown. This was the last chance to halt the threat of total Danish hegemony, to not only claim an England for the English, but to maintain an England that was Christian. The Danes were pagans, and their leader, Guthrum, had specifically threatened to spread eagle Alfred if he should lose the battle. We use the term spread eagling very casually today, but actually it was a ritual humiliation, a ritual torture inflicted on a defeated enemy. They would split open the rib cage and open out the ribs, lifting out the still living lungs, spreading them on the ground like the wings of an eagle to be devoured by the crows. This was a very personal threat to Alfred and a dark reminder of the extent of the pagan menace. Everything depended on the strength of Alfred's shield wall, but it had a lot to contend with. The shield on the battlefield came under attack from a variety of different weapons. At medium to long range, there were bows. Then, at slightly closer range, they used javelins, light throwing spears. Perhaps my favourite of the close range shock weapons was this, the Francisca, the little Frankish throwing axe with its delightful sweeping curves, it's very pleasing to the eye and it was a popular weapon with Saxons and Vikings. Generally a warrior would have two of these, a pair, and he would get to really quite close range and then trying to catch the shield men off guard, he would hurl his Franciscas and then drawing the sword, rush in, hoping to catch the enemy off guard. But the sword was a relatively high status and rare weapon. Much more commonly used was the spear. And this was the main weapon that was used in shield wall fighting. But most devastating of all was the Dane axe, this giant two-handed axe, which had a dreadful power. So how strong were Anglo-Saxon shields? How much punishment could they take? To find out, I've turned for help to a specialist who's been making shields for the past 15 years, Steve Etheridge. Right, and this is my shield room. <laughs> An Aladdin's cave of shields. It's got a few in it, yeah. What you're looking for in a shield, you're looking for two qualities. First of all, obviously, you're looking for strength, but also you want lightness as well. If you're, if you're fighting in a battle for, for longer than a few minutes, you're 
your left arm is going to get really tired. So that might indicate that what they were doing was using two materials which they could combine together to get those properties a composite. A key element will be rawhide, untreated cow skin. One 10th century law even stipulated no shield maker shall cover a shield with a sheepskin. It's a great material, isn't it? It is, it is very good indeed. But you can see it doesn't actually hold the shape very well at the moment. So this is why you have the wood to actually shape it with mm -hmm. the wood sandwiched between the two layers of rawhide. To make a shield, Steve is going to use the wood celebrated by the Anglo-Saxons. Linden wood. Lime. It is an extraordinarily light wood. It is very light. Try bending it. I can really feel the spring in there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really quite flexible. And bends in both exactly, planes. Exactly, yeah. But the big question is, we've got very thin boards. Yes. How are you fixing them together? Only one way it can be. With glue made from cheese. Steve is following an ancient recipe based on a protein called casein that can be extracted from dairy products. A Benedictine monk, Theophilus, wrote it down 900 years ago and recommended it specifically for making shields. Next ingredient is vinegar. This will start to knock out the casein. So we've got an instant chemical reaction. You really can see it separating. Yep. Theophilus says, put back into the mortar and pound it carefully with the pestle and water mixed with quicklime. It will react with the protein to actually make it a little bit stickier. And this is a trial and error quantity? Yes. And you just keep on gently adding this stuff until you've got what you hope are the right proportions. Now we can try Steve's cheese glue in the workshop. It is sticky. Yep. It's, uh, and, it, and it feels rubbery. It feels yeah, like a latex can, type yeah, of glue. You can bring them together and smear over the top. And I know this is going to be covered front and back with rawhide. Yeah. But it still looks terribly flimsy to me. Well, we're just going to have to see if it holds, aren't we? Hours of work still lie ahead. Soaking the rawhide, then cutting and stitching it together. A clue to the durability of Anglo-Saxon shields comes from a Viking text describing a ritual duel, the Holmganger. It was an ancient rite of law amongst the Vikings that they could settle private disputes by means of a duel. They had two forms of duel. There was the Einwege, a very informal affair, and the Holmganger. The rules of the Holmganger are very elaborate. The two people in dispute would go out to an island where no one could interfere in their private dispute. And there they would stake out a cloak on the ground, about 10 foot square. Then they would cut strips of hazel and set that as a perimeter around the cloak. This was then called the hazeled ground. It was formalized, it had legal authority. They would fight with spears, swords, and most often with axes, but it was a stipulation that each man had with him three shields. And this tells us, among other things, that the shield would not be expected to last for the full combat. A man might expect his shield to fail in battle. Each man shall have three shields, and when these are destroyed, he must stand upon the cloak and defend himself only with his weapons. Thorgils held the shield of his brother. Bercy struck a mighty blow and cleft Cormac's shield. Each of them smashed all three of the other's shields. But how well will the shields I've commissioned stand up to the weapons of King Alfred's day? They'll be tested at the Royal Military College of Science at Shrivenham. Shieldmaker Steve Etheridge has specially made two shields using only Anglo-Saxon materials. This is a lime shield glued together with cheese glue. Feather light, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's just six mil of lime glued together. This is the little dinky one. This. Raw high back in front. Raw high back in front. Same thickness of lime in there. So that you, is relatively heavy. You wouldn't have thought it, but it actually adds an awful lot of weight to it. 
Steve's also brought along an old favourite of his, a lens-shaped or lenticular shield. Now, it's made out of plywood and canvas, but it's the right shape. It is. It's lenticular. So, and that has, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, that has got... That's it. That's got structural strength. That's what we want to test on this. The first test is in the long ranges. A high-speed camera will record how the shields respond to attack. Well, you wouldn't want to be standing behind that watch. <laughs> I, I did not expect it to break like that. I thought it might punch a hole through, but split. I'd expect it to develop very fast. You can see that if it's going to go through, it happens in the first couple of milliseconds. In fact, you can see that it actually springs open yeah. and then mm. shuts up on the air and traps it. Yeah. So all that distortion is actually post-event? Yes, it's really. after, after everything's yeah. finished by then. But how will it stand up to the throwing axe? It's actually gone in, just gone in. using the points. Point. Yeah. And the point's actually held it on there. Made the split, and then the weight yeah. of the thing's coming through and crashing it. Yeah. yeah. Plain wooden shield, no good. Absolutely. What we need to do is try composite. With our lime wood shield destroyed, it's time to put rawhide to the test. That saved your life. Oh, clearly that rawhide's done the job, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's the rawhide there, the wood just falls out. So, so, so the composite effect is working on this really yes, well. Sir. But will the rawhide be proof against the Francesca? Spot on. Whoa! I mean, look at the amount of bounce that there well, is. Well, and, in and that. the amount of distortion. Yeah. That's yeah. absorbing just, so much energy. Yeah. Just sucking the weight out see, of the blow. You're going to get no penetration, yeah. so yeah. all the energy is just going to bending the shield. Now, our rawhide shield faces a heavy weapon the Danax. Now, that's done something interesting. That has split the edge binding. An Anglo-Saxon text describes such an event in the midst of battle. The rim of the shield shattered, and the body armor sang one of the songs of terror. I just think the wood has failed, and that's actually split the, the rim. Basically, the rawhide isn't able to spread the weight of the blow quick enough, so that it's all being transferred straight to the wood underneath. Yeah, and once the rawhide's gone, there's then nothing to stop the wood right. folding up. Um, at least once the rim's gone, you've yeah. lost the thing telling that. But how will Steve's lenticular shield stand up to the Danax? That is something special. Now that is justifying lenticular shape, isn't it? Had that been a flat shield, I think it would just have been chopped in half by that. So that's doing the business, isn't it? That is taking all of the energy out of the most powerful hand weapon of its time. To find the breaking point of the lenticular shield, we need to deliver a blow mechanically. The head of the Danax has been mounted in a drop tower. To shatter the shield requires a strike almost four times more powerful than my own. Science can tell us the material strength of a shield, but its effective power depended on the skill of the man behind it. So who were the warriors that made up Alfred the Great's shield wall at Eddington? How did Alfred, who had been hiding in disguise in the Somerset marshes, muster an army? To learn more, I've come to Winchester, Alfred's capital city. At King Alfred's College, I'm meeting with an expert in Anglo-Saxon history, Ryan Lavelle. Alfred sees the, the English people, the Christian English people, as under threat by the Vikings. He's a man with a mission. A man basically. with a mission, a man of destiny, and he sees his role is he has got to put a stop to this. So Eddington is a crucial turning point. He needs a militia, basically. He needs a fiat. And a fiat is an old English word which means journey. It means that all the free men are meant to come to a central point and fight for the kingdom. He would be somebody who was well trained, well armed. There is this notion that you're meant to go into service for 40 days and 40 nights and training with their comrades, the people who are going to be fighting alongside them in the shield wall or in the thick of battle. We don't really know to what extent they were armed, but what we might assume is that they did at least have a weapon, probably a spear and almost certainly a shield. The mark of a man is to be a warrior in this society and so the, you would expect the people in the, the fear that Alfred is bringing to Eddington to actually have a shield as well as a, a spear because they, you know, they are not going to survive in the battle no. without <laughs> at least a shield. But how did Alfred's shield wall work at Eddington? 
we can get a good idea by looking at modern shield wall manoeuvres. This is the riot police training centre at Gravesend. Um, these are the Metropolitan Police long shield. The long shields that you have there are made of a polycarbonate material named Macrolon. The strength of it is in its flexibility, I'll touch on that in a few seconds time. The energy of any thrown missile or handheld weapon is absorbed really by the flexibility of the shield. Pretty effective. Oh, yeah. The only trouble is it is very flexible over the top, and that's yeah, why so they wear protective helmets. Helmet. Yeah, that's right. But otherwise, it's you've got quite a lot of protection behind oh, it. Oh yeah, once you start, I mean, it's like up saying, Once you start to trust the equipment, indeed, and that's what this training is about. Right. Okay, back into a corner. Okay, so straight across. Go. Go. Police are using tactics that wouldn't have been out of place in an Anglo-Saxon battle. We have seen the police drill with snatch squads so that with the people with the round shields are coming through the front line of people with their square shields going out to get troublemakers. We think that that's something that would have been done with the Saxon shield wall sending SWAT squads out. So the shield's being used in very similar ways. During the miners' strike, police shield tactics were instrumental in breaking the picket cordon. Such tactics of solid defence and rapid sorties must have been used 1,100 years ago by Alfred, here at Eddington. As the Vikings advanced from Chippenham in the north, Alfred marched his army out to meet them head on. Led by Guthrum, the Vikings probably stationed themselves here at Bratton Camp. It's an ancient hill fort above the village of Eddington, where I met local military historian, Robin Wilson. Before the battle, how far away is Alfred? About five miles, and therefore he would have started at dawn. So once they kick off, it's going to happen He would have been quickly. up here couple probably of sort of in the couple, first couple of hours of the morning. That's right. And whereabouts do you think that, 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 that Guthrum has Guthrum would have taken his... I camp. would have suggested would have his um, outposts set on here, Burton Camp, on Eddington Hill and the Long Ridge here. Because the panorama and is spectacular, isn't it? I mean, oh, you really can see all around. That would have made sure that he wasn't going to be At encircled yeah. by Alfred. Compared with modern forces, the armies that faced up to each other at Eddington were relatively small, perhaps 3,000 warriors on each side. Alfred assembled his troops to the west and approached out of sight from the enemy. The Vikings challenged him here in open battle, lining up their own shield wall on the high ground. So we've got Guthrum holding the ridge. It's up to Alfred to bring the battle up to Guthrum, isn't it? Alfred would be looking for a space to get through, but he would have had to come and concentrate his forces somewhere fairly close by now in amongst those valleys. They'd have heard them coming, wouldn't they? But they wouldn't quite know where because the sound would distort in all these little right. valleys. Yeah. Having got into position, they would have formed up in their line abreast with their shields interlocked and they would then move forward, bashing their shields. So he would be advancing his men up the slope and they'd know in their hearts as they flooded up there and they would, that wall was standing steadfast and they'd have to get there and then smash through. That was the job that had to be done. This frontline training gives an insight into the courage needed in the heat of battle if your main protection is a shield. Here the police are training to stand against bone missiles, in this case petrol bombs. Missiles were a major threat against the shield wall. Showers of arrows, spears, thrown axes. And exercises like this habituate the warrior to stand against such things. And I'm sure that young boys in the Saxon villages would have been made to stand and face an arrow coming at the shield, be made to face a spear and be made to face an axe. My investigation into shields has taken me from duels to modern-day riots.
Now, to explore the maneuverability of a shield wall, I've summoned a hundred raw recruits for a 21st century feared militia. I think we're supposed to be um, being trained to use shields. Really, we're going to be doing Saxon shield positions, whatever that involves. <laughs> Our shields aren't very thick, they're very flimsy. I'm very concerned. I'm an electrician. <laughs> <laughs> I was just passing. <laughs> Before the Battle of Eddington, Alfred the Great had to assemble his militia from the local population in great haste. So how quickly can a group of volunteers be forged into a cohesive unit? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming. Now, what we're going to do is some shield wall training. The shield wall was the principal military tactic in Anglo-Saxon England. And what it requires is disciplined, cohesive troops. So we've assembled you, brave volunteers, to see how quickly we can train people to do that. A reenactment group, the Vikings of Middle England, are going to be my expert lieutenants. When you've got the basic manoeuvres, we will try and put you all together and see if the thing falls apart or holds strong. The militia is split up into groups for basic drilling. 17, get back in line, stop wiggling forward. Thank you. Right. Shield. Whoa. Shield. Whoa. Good start, excellent. A basic wall is proving straightforward but they've got to cope turn. with attacks from all directions. Again, yeah? About turn. There you go, well done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've got no arm. <laughs> if I tried to pull that, I couldn't. And if I could, the whole line would move, because you're locked. Yeah, it's no team. On right? If one of you fail, you're all failed, because you've got a hole. And once it's a hole, people can get in, and when they're in, they can walk down the line and kill you all. Good. We know they're pretend shields, they're not the real thing, but behind there, do you, do you feel a security? Yeah. yeah. Makes you feel braver than you would do otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> so if I were to charge you, you'd hold firm? Yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter where I come in the ranks, if I try to burst through, you'd all resist me, would you? Yeah. yeah. You sure you can resist me? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Can I just borrow your shield for a second? That's exactly right. If you've got a SWAT SWAT coming in or something, you need to brace that and use your body to do that. <laughs> the real strength of the shield wall is its ability to form depth, particularly against shock attacks from cavalry. If they're only too deep, then I can get the horse to punch through them and really get into those shields. Get on! And get behind them. Now they're in disarray and I really can get in amongst them. Here, the cavalry have the advantage. I think what you need to do, guys, is I think you need to form up much deeper than that, perhaps four, five, or even more deep. A denser formation should stand a much better chance of holding firm. Now the shield wall's denser, the horse loses momentum, and I'm trapped, and I have to fight my way out. <laughs> So clearly, against well-formed, well-disciplined infantry, the cavalry are at a disadvantage. But such discipline needs good battlefield communications. Unit, dressing left. <laughs> Unit, halt. Ow, him, ow. <laughs> oh, some cohesion's coming. It's definitely getting there. It's definitely slowly. Getting there. Unit, about, turn. Oh. Oh. Shouted orders are almost impossible to hear once battle begins. In the clamour of war, one solution is military music. Romans used a trumpet for horsemen and a large blowing horn called a bocino for the infantry. Because um, military music goes through the ages, it, doesn't it? It goes on and on, yes, yes. I mean, there is even a, a trumpet call for crash landing in the Royal Air Force. This is one of the earliest surviving instruments, the Winchester Moot Hall. So it's sort of Norman? Sort of 1185. Of um, feel the weight. My it God. 13 pounds. They wouldn't have run around a battlefield with it. A real horn. It's much lighter. As you so it's just a simple feel horn? Feel the weight of Oh, that. yeah. Nice! 
Hold on. Shield. Woo. The big command for this exercise is form shield, shield wall. That's an easy one. I think they'll be able to pick that up. That's extremely impressive. Though you know with the war shout, you need to be very sparing. There's a Roman writer, Vigatius, and he said that uh, men who scream out before they're in contact with the enemy are cowards, and they're wasting a lot of energy. So I think it's good. That raises your spirits to go in there, but I think you shouldn't do too much shouting until you're in actual contact with the enemy. But of course, the enemy could have manoeuvred and be coming round your sides. They could be outflanking you. Okay. So what are they going to do about that? Unit, about, turn. Lock. Very good. Are you going to turn back? Turn. Oh, that wasn't so good, was it? Oh. I think they ought to get it right yeah. unless before we give them some lunch. About, turn. That's better, isn't it? That's yes, better. I think we might feed them now. 200 years after the Battle of Eddington, the shield wall still dominated English battlefields. But then, in 1066, the Saxon shield wall faced its ultimate challenge, the threat of full-scale invasion. William of Normandy had sailed with a state-of-the-art army and landed at Hastings. His aim the total conquest of England. You see here on the Bayer tapestry, he not only brought a host of men, but also horses, horses for cavalry. And they carried with them a revolution in shield design, the kite shield. The most distinctive feature of the kite shield is that it has this very long tail. Now clearly it does protect the lower leg and certainly that was its function for infantry, for men on the ground. But that's not how it was used by the cavalry. If you had it in front as a cavalryman, it acts like a sail. It's aerodynamically very inefficient and it gets in the way of your horse control. The Bayer tapestry shows us kite shields held at a 45 degree angle and that's because their tactic was to ride up to the shield wall. throw their spears, and it's then as they wheel away that they're at their most vulnerable. Now this is the beauty of the kite shield. It's protecting both me and the horse's flank from the barrage of missiles as we turn away. These hit and run tactics were exactly those used by the Norman cavalry when they confronted the Saxon shield wall at the Battle of Hastings. For nine hours, King Harold's warriors stood firm behind their shields, soaking up wave upon wave of thrown spears. Chroniclers claim the shield wall was locked so tight that any dead could not fall to the ground. But late in the day, they broke ranks and chased downhill after the Norman cavalry. Once their formation was broken, they were easy prey. England's Saxon shield wall was annihilated. William's victory ushered in a new order and the arrival of the medieval knight on the battlefield. With him came a new way of fighting, impact warfare. This needed full face guards for protection. But a knight's principal motivation was to win fame and glory through martial prowess. He needed to be recognized and so heraldry was born. Shields became a colorful canvas for chivalric display. As armor technology improved, the shield's days were numbered. In the 15th century, it became possible to encase a man completely in hardened steel, and the shield became all but obsolete on the battlefield. Yet right through the Renaissance, shields retained their significance as the mark of a warrior They became status symbols, fashioned for parade. I mean, clearly, this is not a shield for fighting with. If it weren't for the curvature, it, it is essentially a panel painting. It's oils gilded, and uh, you, know, you might expect to see it hanging in the, in the National Gallery. So, but shields like this came in, I mean, there's this, this whole fashion 
in, in, in mm. the 16th century for parade armour and parade yes. shields. Yes. I mean, what's that all about? Conspicuous display. It's a nice, large surface. Really beautiful. And therefore, any large surface lends itself to decoration, lends itself to showing how rich and tasteful and well-educated you are to have something like this emblazoned on your shield. Despite their disappearance from the battlefield, shields remained centre stage in the joust. Knights scored points for breaking a lance on their opponent, and so shields evolved into targets. Just keep your eyes on my opponent's shield. One of the most extraordinary was seen in the extravagant jousts held at the court of Henry VIII's great ally, the Emperor Maximilian. It was spring-loaded to explode on impact in a grand display of skill and theatre. Such elaborate designs were far removed from the brutal reality of survival on the battlefields of Anglo-Saxon England. But 600 years after the Battle of Eddington, the shield evolved again into something even more bizarre. Shields took on a new role on the continent as an instrument in ritualized judicial combat. It's a natural tendency for us to think of shields as defensive objects, which they are most of the time. But there are uh, certain types of shields, though, that are distinctly offensive in their very conception. And certainly by the middle of the 15th century, you, you see these very strange, giant, sharp shields, called a dueling shield, used specifically uh, for the judicial combats in Germany. The essence of their law was that the wrongdoer owed compensation to the victim. So if you killed my brother, you'd owe me 20,000 pounds or whatever the fee may be. But if you denied it, then the law would ensure that I could get satisfaction from you in a judicial duel, and they'd force us to fight. And we can see here, it's wonderful, the court officials are forcing these people to fight. Yes, the judicial dueling shield is this strange weapon that you would never use for anything else. It's a unique than... weapon, it's not yes. used in war, it's yes. specifically for this function, yes. so they would have to yes. train. So they're, they're kind of starting at, 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 as equals because Absolutely. nobody's used it before. And they're clearly fighting to the death. These shields have got great sharp iron shod spikes on them. If the loser wasn't killed outright, he would be taken out and hung in any case. So it was deadly serious. Uh, and it was left ultimately to the judgment of God. But the manuscripts can only tell us so much. I've had some replicas built in order to experiment. Why didn't you attack me with a couple of sort of staff type moves? Let's see what I can do with it. Yeah, that seems to work. That feels it's, it's fairly organic and natural. Now, here we've got leverage, which again is something they talk about. So there's quite a lot of leverage, and they, and they, and they talk about enveloping it, about binding it. And binden, the manuscript says. So if I bind you over and thrust them. Ah, now if you're there, I can see immediately I can come in. I've got you. It's in there and I can bring you down from there. End game, look at me. So, yeah, that one seems to work quite well. I mean, I think that this one's particularly interesting. Look how this character is resting the spike on the ground. Because it's hiding behind it, isn't it? Yeah. I can't read where that attack is going to come. Mm. And what the manual says is that from this position, both are strong guards and both parties can charge each other with their shields. So if you were going to charge me with your shield, and I would get in there, and we've got those shields locked. And the other thing that text says here, it says, and from this position, you can do handsome work with the shields. Hubscher Arbeit, it says in the text. And the Hubscher Arbeit that occurs to me is my hook is near your leg, and you're down. It really is a useful weapon, isn't it? I mean, a lot of it is like staff work, the way that one's using one's hands with it, but you've got so many other things you can do. You can charge with it, you can use the spikes to thrust with, you use those hooks to hook with. It really is a most versatile weapon. Down the ages, shields evolved in many different ways, but it was as a weapon in Anglo-Saxon England that it played its greatest role. So how hard was it for Alfred to train his shield wall? And once we start battlefield manoeuvres, will our volunteers stand or fall? Oh. I've taken a hundred volunteers and in just one day tried to mould them into a shield wall like Alfred the Great at the Battle of Eddington. 
After basic training, it's now time for the key test. Can we get the groups to act as one cohesive unit? Well, David, they seem to have had their lunch and rested. Let's see if we can bring this army together as one unit. Call to arms, please. Truly magnificent. Let's hear your war shout all together. <laughs> Excellent. Now you can imagine the din of battle. People shouting, you've got helmets on, the clash of your weapons. It's going to be very difficult now for you to hear the commands and what's happening. So now we're going to bring in Dave Edwards with his bugle. Now the first command he's going to blow is for you to go into open order. Come on, look lively. Make space, make space on the end there. The next command will be for you to fall into two ranks. Now into four ranks. Come on, look lively. Right, now we've got you looking like an army. What we need to do is see if you can move. Our raggle-taggle militia is starting to look something like Alfred the Great's army. Double time! Up the crowd. Stop! That's pretty damned impressive. An about turn. Very good. And advance the men! Double time! Stop them, David! Form shield wall. If you're wondering what happens next, well, obviously, with our volunteers, we can't actually show you that without shedding some of their blood. But if I were the enemy commander, I only have a limited number of options. If I've got superior forces, vastly superior forces, then I can attempt to outflank them. I could make horns, a forceps-type movement, coming round both their flanks. If I don't have superior numbers, then I've somehow got to smash through the shield wall. I could do this by sending out SWAT squads, some of my bravest, my biggest men, Go. with their great two-handed axes to force their way, chop their way through the wall. Yeah. Or I could form my whole army into a formation, into a boar's snout. At the front would be the forlorn hope. They would surely die, but they would be pushed up by the men behind and relentlessly it would march until it burst into the shield wall. The writer recorded what happened at the Battle of Eddington. With a close shield wall, Alfred fought fiercely against the army of the pagans. His attack was long and spirited. Finally, by divine aid, he overthrew the pagans with very great slaughter. It's been a hugely interesting day, and I'm really impressed at how well the volunteers have done. They've picked those drills up incredibly quickly. Totally different than I thought it would. Um, it just shows that, you know, different people from different walks of life with little or no experience can uh, get along and produce a really good team. It's been a remarkable experience, actually, enlightening to what was happening then and how those guys must have felt to have the horses and stuff charged. It must have been terrifying. I mean, yeah, you've got to scream back as loud as you can just to get the fear out of yourself. And when the two groups first came together and formed that great long line, it really fed my imagination to see how a massive army arrayed on the hills, just like Alfred's army at Eddington, really would have looked like. And then they went into multiple ranks, really deep, and looking through them you could see how impenetrable the war was. And it's a really good tactic for an army of disparate people. So, for a militia army, where you're taking the free men from the counties, men who are not full-time soldiers, and we had that today, we had people of different shapes, different sizes, different backgrounds, and yet, when they were all together, you just simply had the impression of the whole. And that, I think, is a really important factor about the Saxon shield wall. It was a military force that enabled the people of the villages to come together and look like a full-time military army.
Shields have played an important role in British history since ancient times. From works of art, to swashbuckling, tournament targets, to riot police shields of the 21st century. But it was in Anglo-Saxon times that they had their heyday, and none more so than at the Battle of Eddington. Alfred's victory halted the Viking advance, laying the ground for the unification of England. For his valiant defence of his land and culture, Alfred alone, of all the English kings and queens, is known as the Great. <laughs>